Okay, members. Um, if members just resume their seats, please. Uh, we will now move on to questions to the Minister for Infrastructure. I can see items are Linda Dillon and then Kate Kestakur. I call Linda Dillon to ask the first question. Gormay, I'll get to Lashkin and Corlea. Kestakur, Hain. Question number one. I can see items are in either infrastructure. I call the Minister for Infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. Uh, my department manages the adoption of roads that are proposed for adoption through the private streets determination process, which is undertaken as part of the planning process. Once planning permission is received, my officials work closely with developers and financial institutions to pursue adoption of these development roads in a timely fashion. My department has undertaken almost 1,100 private street adoptions and developments over the last five years, and progress has been made in adopting a significant number of unadopted developments that emanated from the property crash in 2007. The member will also appreciate that the adoption of private streets within developments is a developer-led process, and the majority progress to adoption without the need for intervention by my department or Northern Ireland Water. I also fully appreciate the concerns of residents in unadopted developments and the difficult situations some find themselves in. My department continues to work closely with developers, NI Water, financial institutions and residents to get roads and sewage infrastructure adopted. I am committed to ensuring that developers provide road and sewage infrastructure to a standard suitable for adoption in a timely manner, and to impress on developers the need to, de to provide safe and adequate infrastructure for residents in the interim period prior to adoption. Uh, Linda Dillon, supplementary question for Linda Dillon. I'd like to thank the Minister for her answer, but what I'm referring to is more the historical issue around unadopted roads, developments and streets. So this is not a new thing from 2007. We obviously have the bond and, and we have been able to resolve a number of those within my own constituency. But there is an inequality and there is an issue here for people real life every day and this has gone on in some areas for up to 50 years when the old councils built the developments and didn't do what needed to be done at that time. So we have a responsibility to these people, and I think that we need to start actually delivering for them now. So there are no developers that they can go back to. There is nowhere where they can turn, and we really need now as a, an executive to start dealing with these issues. And I would ask that the minister would engage with some of the residents in my constituency, particularly around Coal Island and Donoughmore, where there are a number of these estates and streets that have this, this historical issue. I thank the member for her question, and she is correct. There are a number of, of historical unadopted roads and laneways uh, within Northern Ireland that sit outside of the private streets process. Article 9 of the Private Streets Order 1980 allows my department to consider adoption of some roads um, if the majority of the owners or frontagers request it and the road or street is first brought up to the required adoption standard. While I do understand that there is a desire among frontagers to on private roads and lanes to have improvement works carried out by my department, the reality is that it is not feasible due to the current budget position and the many pressures faced by my department. There was a scoping study carried out in 2011 which found that there were over 620 kilometres of unadopted roads and laneways in Northern Ireland. At that time, it was estimated to be in the region of £300 million to bring them up uh, to stand and that was excluding any land purchase or required structures or utility work. So this is an issue, but it is an issue requiring huge resource. Here Mayor Dolores Kelly for your case. I called Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for answer. Minister, I know that your department is undergoing a planning policy review. Will that review include looking at some of the developer contributions in terms of uh, the adoptions of roads and ensure that there is a significant financial penalty for not doing so? I thank the member for her question. She is right. Um, my department is carrying out a, a review of the Planning Act. And the purpose of that review is to ensure that the objectives um, that were intended through that legislation are being met, uh, but also examine things that can be retained, uh, amended uh, or repealed. And my officials are currently going out to consultation with councils, with businesses, environmental groups and other key stakeholders. And I'm sure this will be an issue that will be raised with them. I'll call Johnny Buckley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And the Minister knows that this is an issue that I have long championed in, championed in my own constituency in relation to Birchwood Manor. And I would echo the comments by the initial question from Linda Dillon that this is an issue that I know the Minister finds unacceptable, but to date, 
limited progress has been made on some of the outstanding issues across many constituencies. Uh, the, I thank the Minister since then in terms of uh, her department's willingness to engage with both uh, residents and indeed uh, with NI Water and roads development. Would the Minister also agree that there is a need to engage with the banks now as well to ensure that we can get a timely satisfactory outcome and allow these residents to live at peace in their developments? I thank the member for his question uh, and I thank him for his kind comments in respect um, of officials' work on this issue. It is a complex issue and it is one that my department is working to try to address with developers, with residents, as he's rightly pointed out, but as he has also correctly said, the importance of engaging with the financed, financial institutions as well as we try to resolve this difficult thing. Call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. That will be question two, Minister. Thank the member for his question. Uh, in 2019 and 2020, Northern Ireland Water and DFI Roads undertook measures to remove considerable amounts of stormwater from the foul sewage system. It was this excess stormwater during periods of intense rainfall which was the cause of out of sewer flooding in St. Field. DFI Roads has replaced a damaged storm culvert on the Studer Road, and Northern Ireland Water has undertaken repair work on sewer pipes in the same area. Additionally, the sewers in Old Grand Jury Road have been repaired by Northern Ireland Water, greatly increasing the resilience of the sewage system during heavy rainfall. Finally, Northern Ireland Water conducted extensive CCTV and flow surveys for use in developing a drainage area sewer network model in 2019. The model build phase was completed in December 2019 and audited for use in 2020. And the output of this model has been shared with NIEA, which will come back to NI Water once it has completed its assessment of the data. Mary Harvey for supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. I appreciate your considering upgrades in all constituencies to allow building of new homes to continue. Could the Minister assure me that she will address current infrastructure issues within Strangford, particularly in relation to flooding, which poses a health and safety risk? Thank you. I thank the member for his question. My department has not identified any significant flood risk areas in the Strangford area. However, coastal areas and roads can be subject to large overtopping waves when strong onshore winds occur and sea levels are high. My department has well rehearsed emergency response plans that have been developed in conjunction with multi agency partners, should there be a need to respond to flooding in the area. I am also aware that some isolated properties that are at flood risk have availed of my department's homeowner flood protection grant scheme, and this scheme is intended to assist homeowners make their property more resilient to flooding. Call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister may be aware that elsewhere in the Strangford constituency, a major development at Rivenwood in Newton Ards is under threat because of an unexpected million pound bill for the developers because of a lack of sewage infrastructure. Can the Minister detail uh, how many planning applications are being withheld uh, due to sewage infrastructure being at or indeed above capacity? I thank the member for his question and he raises a, a very important uh, issue and difficulty. While I don't have at hand the number of planning applications that are currently being impacted, I can advise the member that there are some 116 locations across Northern Ireland that are either at maximum or almost at maximum capacity, thereby curtailing their developmental potential. This is an issue of huge concern. It impacts every constituency. It is impacting on every local development plan that is being developed uh, by our councils. It will curtail the number of homes that we can build, Mr Deputy Speaker, the number of uh, schools uh, and hospitals. Uh, and the utility regulator has identified £2 billion that is required in investment for the next price control period. So this is an issue that affects every government department, every community, and it is an issue that we must tackle. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number three, please. As the member may remember from the recent Assembly debate on ammonia, I advised that I had written to the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs about the ongoing ammonia and nitrates deposition issues we face, particularly as they affect the planning system. I highlighted the need for DERA to urgently revise its current operational protocol on ammonia emitting projects, which is used as the basis for DERA's advice to planning authorities in its role as a statutory consultee. 
I also asked for an update on the current position with the ammonia strategy and how, in the interim, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency can provide the advice needed to enable planning applications for ammonia emitting development that are currently on hold to be determined. Furthermore, I committed my department to assist DERA in taking forward work on its proposed ammonia strategy, which I understand is to include a review of the operational protocol. In his response to me, Minister Poots advised that work on the ammonia strategy is in its final stages of preparation and will be completed before the end of this year, and when completed will be issued for public consultation. He also stated that with regard to the ammonia-related planning consultations that have been delayed, they are currently under consideration and that he will be discussing them with his officials shortly. Chair Bailey for a supplementary. Thank you. And I thank the Minister for her comprehensive answer, and that's very heartening to hear. Um, of course, the Minister will be very aware that the, of the ongoing high risk to both human health and the environmental damage that occurs the longer that we don't tackle this problem. So, during the same debate in the Assembly, there was a commitment to also consult fully with the farming and agri-food sector, and I'm just wondering if that has happened by either yourself or anyone in your department? As the member highlights, this was an issue that was discussed, um, and my role on this is from the planning um, perspective, and I am conscious as well that in the same debate there was a discussion around implementing a moratorium on planning approvals, um, but I can confirm that I have engaged with the dear Minister um, directly. Um, we have not as yet gone out further afield, because my view on this is that the urgency that is required is the review and updating of the operational protocol by DERA to ensure that it is able to respond to consultations consultations in a way that is based on the most recent case law and the most up-to-date scientific data on the issue of ammonia. Um, and it's already been mentioned around improving the guidance on, on ammonia, but I'm just wondering if the Minister can elaborate on whether there's any scope in the plan and review um, to look at improving other environmental aspects of the planning system. Thank you. I thank the member um, for her question. Um, as I outlined, I think, in the response to um, Dolores Kelly, the review of the Act is reviewed, a review to ensure that it's meeting the intended uh, objectives. But as I said, my officials are out going around doing a targeted consultation exercise, uh, and so I would encourage people to be engaging with my officials and to be raising those issues so that we can explore what can be done. If not within the, t the framework of the current review, then certainly um, at a later date. I call Andrew Muir. Very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister is aware of shared environmental services and the role they play in relation to this. Can the Minister outline when a review was last conducted of the shared environmental services? The member is, is, is correct to point out that the uh, shared environmental services is a service that is shared across all uh, of the councils. It was developed um, when we moved to the two-tier planning system. I am not aware that there has been a subsequent review uh, to that. I am aware, though, that councils have been asked to increase their financial contribution towards the shared environmental services, given the increase in uh, consultation responses and the work that it is having uh, to engage with. But if there has been a, a review in the interim since the transfer of planning powers. I'm certainly happy to update the member. I call Jim Allister. Not for the first time we have a passing of the parcel between one department and another, but the victims of this are the many farmers who have been waiting out now for months running into years for planning approvals. And where it's at its most farcical is those who are wanting to replace old houses with more environmentally friendly houses with less output, and yet they are the very people who uh, are failing to have their needs met. When will the executive get a grip on this issue? I thank the member for his question, uh, and I think he was present during the debate um, on this issue, so he will be well aware that the difficulty here is that DERA has not to date 
updated its operational protocol. That is the issue that is causing delay in terms of the determination of the planning uh, applications. Uh, to my mind, if I recall correctly, there are around 19 planning applications that are being held in the planning system pending determination. So I think that one of the key issues in terms of resolving this matter would be for DERA to complete the work that it has indicated that is currently undertaking so that it can update its operational protocol, ensuring that the most up-to-date responses are being provided to applicants and they can be appropriately processed. Era Mayor Declan McAleer for Hunya Kesh. I call Declan McAleer. Carmel Goodlas, Concordia. Kesh, Derek Yahar, question four. Thank the member for his question. I want to reiterate my commitment to the A5 and to tackling regional imbalance, connecting communities and improving road safety. There are so many communities, particularly in rural parts west of the ban, who can benefit from investment in the A5 project. The project has been subject to three separate legal challenges since its inception in 2007, the most recent being in December 2017 when a new decision to proceed with a scheme made in the absence of a minister was challenged, leading to the quashing of the statutory orders in November 2018. Since then, my department has been actively progressing the necessary work to enable a fresh decision to be made. In spring 2019, an addendum to the Environmental Statement of 2016, together with other environmental reports, were published for consultation. This resulted in a further public inquiry, which concluded in March of this year, and my department received the interim report from the inspector in September. My officials have considered the issues raised and recommendations made in this interim report and have taken legal advice. I will be considering this legal advice and all advice carefully before deciding on the next steps for the scheme and the timing of the publication of the inspector's report, but I can assure the member of my commitment to this scheme. Declan McAleer, supplementary question. Declan Good. And I'm glad to hear the Minister's uh, commitment to this scheme. Um, I thank her very much for her answer. Uh, the Minister will be aware that this is a, a very a crucially important uh, project for the West and indeed the North West of the island of Ireland. So I wonder could the Minister update us on any um, recent uh, contact or consultation she's had with her counterpart, Minister Ryan, in Dublin in relation to the Irish Government's part funding of this scheme? Carmel, good. I thank the member for his question and I welcome the Irish Government's reaffirmation of its commitment uh, to contribute £75 million uh, to this project in New Decade New Approach. I can assure the member that I have had useful discussions with the Irish Transport Minister, uh, Minister Ryan, and the Taoiseach on delivering on our shared commitments. I think it is very good news that the Taoiseach announced in October that €500 million Euro will be made available through the Shared Island uh, Fund to deliver on the Irish Government's commitment to build shared island infrastructure underpinned by the Good Friday Agreement. And this funding is intended to contribute to the delivery of key infrastructure initiatives, including the A5. I can assure the member I am committed to working with my colleagues in the Irish Government to ensure that we deliver for our citizens and in fact we are due to meet again as an NSMC on Friday and I have no doubt that this matter will be raised. Uh, Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. It's always a great honour to speak about the A5 and something that I feel very, very strongly about and uh, the SDLP absolutely very strongly support uh, its development. Minister, uh, your commitment to the A5 has been cast iron, and the people of West Tyrone are grateful uh, to your office uh, for making it such a strong priority. Uh, Minister, uh, many people are looking forward to seeing boots on the ground. Have you any indication as to when that might happen? As I indicated um, to the member, um, my officials have obtained detailed legal advice um, on the report that we have received. Um, I will be considering that very carefully uh, and all advice before announcing my next steps. It is not possible until that decision is reached to give a, a clear time frame, but I do want to assure the House that I have said on multiple occasions that I am committed uh, to this project and I am keen to see it progressed uh, as far as possible within my tenure. Gary Middleton for our case. Question number five, Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for his question. Uh, construction work is progressing well on the two flagship duelling schemes on the A6 road, the Randallstown to Castle Dawson scheme and the Dungiven to Drumahoe scheme. Together, these schemes represent an investment of over £400 million to enhance the connectivity of the North West, improve journey time reliability, reduce journey times and improve road safety. 
COVID-19 disrupted or stopped many activities due to difficulties in the supply chain, social distancing requirements and staff absences. However, I am pleased to be advised that the projects are on track. I was pleased to see at first hand the new five kilometre section of the Randallstown to Castle Dawson scheme which opened to traffic last week. This means the entire 15 kilometre scheme is now open to traffic, although there are still works ongoing and temporary traffic management will be in place for several months. The benefits of this scheme are already being realised and fully welcomed by the public, and the scheme will be fully complete in the spring. The 25.5 km done given to Drummond Hill scheme is expected to complete in 2022, largely as planned. And finally, the delivery of Phase 2 of the A6 Derry to Dungiven Road project, which extends from Drumahoe to the Car Roundabout, is key and will depend on a range of factors, including future budget settlements. A supplementary for Gary Middleton. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her response. I also want to put on record my thanks to her department and the contractor for uh, working with local residents on some local issues uh, along the scheme, so I do welcome that. Can the Minister give any clarity in terms of whether or not uh, the, the scheme is on budget, uh, and are there any concerns around uh, lack of funds to, to complete the scheme? Yeah. In terms uh, of the funding that's been set aside, um, um, in terms of the COVID impact, um, I did, because things moved rather quickly, um, made a, a bid for £14.8 million pounds to um, the executive and to the finance minister, um, and we increased the budget by that so that it could move ahead. So certainly from the advice that I'm receiving for, from officials, I don't have any concerns in that regard, and we are on track to meet all of the targets and deadlines in terms of the delivery of the project, particularly around the time frame as well, which I know will be welcome news to the member. Martina Anderson, for your case, call Martina. Good morning, good. Uh, Minister, as you would know, Chris Hazard, Sinn Féin, he championed this in 2016 and secured the funding. And I was glad to hear that you talked about the call roundabout uh, to drum a hole being crucially important and being key. So could you tell us what efforts is being made to take us through the statutory process before you get to the point where you're going to put in the bid? As the member says, yes, phase two of the A6 Derry to Dungiven Road project extends from Drumahoe to the A2 Call Roundabout. This seven kilometre section is estimated to cost around £200 million and forms part of the A6 flagship project. As the member will know, parts of the works will encroach on the Maboy Waste site, and the final design will need to take this into account. Delivery of this phase of the project, which is not part of the current Dungiven to Drumahoe construction contract, is key, in my view, and will depend on a range of factors, including future budget settlements. Uh, and I look forward to the member joining me in making representations to the executive to secure the funding that is required. Roy Beggs for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. <coughs> the, the completion of the A6 will considerably improve the travel time uh, between the North West to Belfast and indeed to Dublin. Uh, undoubtedly that will have some effect on the viability of Derry City Airport where more people will choose to travel. Can the Minister advise uh, when uh, that road is expected to be completed and how that may influence subsequent additional public funding which is continuing to be passed to Derry City Airport? I thank the member for his question. Um, as I indicated in previous responses uh, today, uh, we are on track to meet the, the time frame for the A6. Um, so that section is due for completion in 2022, and we're on track um, to meet that. In respect of the issue of um, the City of Derry Airport, the member will, may be aware that York Aviation have been commissioned to carry out a study into the viability of the airport and it will analyse all of the surrounding factors. Um, that report has been submitted to a number of the departments uh, across the executive given the statutory responsibilities for airport cuts across uh, a number of ministries. So my officials are currently considering that uh, as I will be with my executive colleagues. Cara Hunter for your case to call Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Minister, I welcome the progress so far uh, on the A6 and uh, welcome the work from you and your department. Um, the route will have many major benefits for my constituents. Uh, my question pertains to uh, an update on the section of the A6 from the Castle Dawson roundabout uh, to Dungiven. 
thank the member for her question. Um, my department is currently developing a new regional strategic transport network transport plan. It's a nice snappy title, which will set out future investment and improvement for our strategic transport networks by road, rail and bus, and reflect my commitment to improving connectivity for the benefit of our, of our economy and communities across Northern Ireland. This will consider proposals for the further development of strategic road improvement schemes, including the Castle Dawson to Dungiven section of the A6, and how it might facilitate complementary improvements to promote sustainable travel choices, connect people and communities, and create thriving and livable places. I intend publishing the draft Regional Strategic Transport Network Transport Plan for public consultation in late 2021, with a view to issuing the finalised plan in spring 2022. Call Mervyn Storey. Thank uh, Deputy Principal Speaker, and thank the Minister for clarifying, because for some time we have been waiting on the sub-regional uh, transport plan and on correspondence with yourself in relation to the continuation of the A26 in my own constituency, which would connect uh, Ballymena right through to Coleraine. Obviously, it's very important. So you did say late 21. Are we saying that before the end of this year it will be published, or like most things, will it be pushed into 2021 in terms of uh, the, the, the latter part of the year? So it will not be published this year, it will be next year. For clarity, um, uh, I intend publishing the draft regional strategic transport network transport plan <laughs> for public consultation in late 2021 with a view to issuing the finalised plan in spring 2022. I call Chris Little. Question six. Thank the member for his question. Um, my vision is for Belfast to become a cycle-friendly city where anyone can have the freedom and confidence to use the bicycle for their everyday journeys. The bicycle strategy, published in August 2015 by one of my predecessors, set out the objective of building a comprehensive network for the bicycle. One of the elements of that was to develop bicycle networks for the main urban areas in Northern Ireland, and the intention was that the first one would be for Belfast. A public consultation on the draft bicycle, uh, Belfast Bicycle Network was held in 2017, and following consideration of the many responses, some of which were very detailed, a consultation report was published in 2018, during the period when the Assembly was suspended. There was general support for the idea of a network, but the consultation highlighted the need to look more closely at the north and west of the city, where levels of cycling were lower and where there was less walking and cycling infrastructure. My department engaged Sustrans to carry out further work on the active travel feasibility study for North and West Belfast in 2019, and a final report for those two areas was provided to my department earlier this year. Some work has been undertaken to revise the proposed network in light of this, and I have asked officials to ensure that a final document is ready for publication in the new year. Chris Little, first supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her update in relation to the Belfast Cycle Network Plan. Um, as she said, a, a delivery of a, an easy-to-access, easy-to-understand Belfast Cycle Network is a key aim of the cycling strategy, but progress has been delayed for the reasons she outlines. A Welsh Act of Travel Act places a legal requirement on local government to map and plan suitable routes for active travel and to build and improve their infrastructure every year. Is an Act of Travel Act necessary in Northern Ireland to see substantive progress on our cycle network? I thank the member um, for his question. Um, I, I don't know the answer. I don't know if it is um, essential. I think one of the biggest challenges around changing culture uh, within government um, and also outside of it. Uh, we have seen the success um, of active travel pilots, uh, limited in number though they are, um, during COVID and how citizens, if they are given the opportunity to be able to engage in active travel safely, then they will um, embrace it. To reassure the member, while I have initiated a number of policy changes in the department, while I have appointed a walking and cycling champion to ensure the culture change at the heart of my department, I have also asked my officials to bring forward to me a submission so that I can consider the merits of bringing forward active travel legislation. I also have to operate within the reality, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we do not have a significantly long period left in this mandate and we have many other pressures, if not COVID and Brexit. But I want to assure the member that where change can be made, whether that's through resource allocation, whether that's through policy change. Um, I am committed to exploring all avenues, including legislation. 
I have time for a brief question and a brief answer from Robbie Butler. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I know the Minister is, uh, is absolutely hard is in getting people on bikes. Um, would the Minister commit, I know it's not her purview, but to work with her executive uh, colleagues to ensure that there's no financial barrier uh, to those who are disproportionately financially burdened uh, to availing of bicycles to get them fit and uh, also to tackle their mental health? Yes, I think it's very important that we have um, inclusivity and affordability uh, at the heart of this. Uh, the truth is that there are so many families across Northern Ireland who can't afford to own a car, who are reliant on public transport um, and who could hugely benefit from being able to access safe infrastructure when it comes to cycling and walking. So this is an environmental issue for me, but this is also uh, an issue of social justice and I remain committed to doing what I can during my tenure to bring about change in the lives of our citizens right across the north. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Dr. Steve Aiken. Uh, I thank you very much indeed, and may I thank the Minister for answers so far. I could ask the Minister what provisions are being made for local HGV drivers for operating in the EU after the 1st of January, please. I thank the member for his question. Uh, he raises an important point, and I am sensitive to the fact that discussions between negotiating teams are ongoing, and the outcome will be determined by the British government and the EU. Any outcome that places a limit on the number of hauliers permitted to travel south to transport and receive goods, such as the need for an ECMT permit, will have the potential for serious supply chain disruption and detrimental economic impacts in the north. I welcome the recent contingency arrangements for a no deal announced by the EU, which are subject to UK uh, reciprocity, and confirm that hauliers would not require an ECMT permit. I do, however, have some concerns that hauliers would not be allowed to conduct cabotage or cross trade, and my officials continue to stress the importance of free movement by road hauliers on the island of Ireland to the British Government. Mr. Aiken, for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank the Minister for her answer so far. Uh, could the Minister possibly feed into the Joint Ministerial Council that Northern Ireland haulage firms should be given commitments that they will indeed be able to work unimpeded in Great Britain, the EU, and in Northern Ireland, particularly under the provisions of the protocol? I can assure the member that certainly my officials at every opportunity uh, are always stressing the importance and the uniqueness of the North and its situation and raising the concerns that hauliers uh, are rightly expressing to us. We have regular engagement as a department with the haulage sector as well, and I have written to Grant Chaps to raise these concerns directly. Uh, I raise them any time that I'm on Zoom meetings or conference calls uh, with the British Government as well, and I've also written to the Irish Government highlighting my concerns, so I can assure the member that we will continue to avail of every opportunity to raise the issues and the concerns of our haulage sector, given they are so critical to our economy. I call Gordon Dunn for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be very much aware that a large number of taxi drivers have been unable to access her department's financial support scheme. Will the Minister look at how the criteria can be amended to assist those who had the correct insurance, cover and licence at the time of lockdown and are now struggling to make a living? I thank the member for, for raising uh, this question and this issue. The Taxi Driver Financial Assistance Scheme was opened on the 13th uh, of November. That was 10 days after my department was given the powers to create a scheme. And it closed two weeks later on the 27th of November. The scheme, agreed by the executive, is designed to provide a contribution to the overhead costs, including PPA, that have actually been incurred a result, uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this was designed in consultation with the taxi industry representatives who said that while drivers were eligible for the self-employed income support scheme, they still had very static and high overhead costs, not least their taxi insurance, which they were struggling to pay, which is why the, the scheme was designed to be a contribution to overhead costs. Um, the scheme uh, has been set up as a means, as I say, of helping drivers with their ongoing overhead costs 
But in order to ensure value for money, the scheme is dependent on actual expenses being incurred between the 22nd of March and the 30th of September, because it is a retrospective um, scheme. Um, I am aware of issues where taxi drivers who had continuous insurance were not able to obtain evidence of that, and I'm pleased to say my department has worked with insurance companies who are now providing a letter, which we, which we are accepting as validity of that. But I'm also aware of a situation where many taxi drivers uh, dropped their taxi insurance during that typical period. And I have said that I will continue to work with the sector to provide them with support during this time. But I must say I remain disappointed that opportunities have been missed for their inclusion in the Part B scheme uh, run by the Department uh, of the Economy because taxi drivers have been impacted by the restrictions on our hospitality sector. Mr. Dunn for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Could the Minister, though, however, outline the rationale? for the decision not to open the scheme for taxi operators, not drivers I'm talking about, but for operators, and would she give a commitment to meet the taxi operators to discuss the particular circumstances that their businesses now find themselves in, obviously most difficult during this COVID crisis? I thank the member for his question. I have met with the taxi operators and my officials have also met with the taxi operators. Um, as part of the stakeholder engagement process for the financial support schemes, as I said, officials and I held meetings with taxi operators on the 30th of September and the 27th of October. Officials also met with taxi operators on the 20th of October and the 27th of November. And in looking at the available financial support schemes and sector eligibility for those um, because taxi drivers did not have premises, they did not qualify for the Northern Ireland Executive Support Schemes for Businesses. However, taxi businesses and operators that did have premises could have availed of one or other of the business support grant or loan schemes available. This was clear from the evidence and the information provided by them themselves during the scheme's development stage. And so for these reasons, the scheme I put in place is designed to assist taxi drivers who could not avail of the existing schemes but still incurred overhead costs from March until September of this year. In addition, taxi operators themselves advised that providing financial support directly to drivers would provide them with indirect support because we were helping taxi drivers to remain in business and in work. Um, and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Minister, the public inquiry on the A5 concluded in March of this year, and we're still awaiting on a decision. When can we expect construction to begin on this essential and long overdue road scheme? I thank the member for his question, and it was a question that was raised um, under the, the oral questions um, by your party colleague and by a number of, of other members. Um, my department received the uh, report on the A5 in September. It has raised a number of detailed issues that we had to get legal advice on. I will be considering that legal advice very carefully and all of the advice uh, before deciding on next steps. It's therefore not possible at this stage to be able to provide you with a definitive time frame, but I do want to assure you that I remain committed to the delivery of this project. It is a strategic road project. It's a key project in terms of road safety, and it's also critical to tackling regional imbalance. Supplementary question for Colm Gildon. And thank you, thank you for that answer, mm -hmm. Minister. But um, it, is, it is, of course, important that the Irish government honour their commitment to co-fund the project. Um, can you comment on how much of the Shared Ireland Fund the A5 is expected to receive, and if the Minister is considering multiple simultaneous phases of that project? I thank the member for his question, um, and uh, he is right to point out that the Taoiseach has announced €500 million Euros, uh, for the Shared Island Unit, which is for north-south infrastructure um, projects. I have discussed the issue of the A5. I have discussed also Narrow Water Bridge and the other commitments under New Decade New Approach with my ministerial counterpart, Ian Ryan, and also with the Taoiseach. Uh, and we are due to meet again as an NSMC this Friday, and I have no doubt that the A5 and the other commitments in New Decade New Approach uh, will be discussed. Dolores Kelly. Dolores Kelly for a quick. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, I know that you have been working hard uh, with the travel industry, and particularly TransLink, in relation to keeping people safe during COVID-19, and I thank you for that. But in relation to Christmas and particular challenges around road safety, drink driving and drug taking, have you any particular measures or in place? 
Now, the member um, asks a very important question as families prepare to make their way home together uh, to bubble this Christmas in line with government regulations. Um, COVID remains very much with us um, and we are at risk, so we almost do what we can to protect ourselves and our family from the virus. And I would urge all travellers to plan ahead to wear a face covering, keep your distance and wash your hands. Uh, and today I issued a statement urging those travelling to take care, whether by private or public transport. I've also reminded drivers that my department will be carrying out parking and moving traffic bus lane enforcement as normal to ensure that vehicles are parked safely and are not causing disruption in bus lanes and elsewhere. And as many of us will hopefully uh, be able to safely enjoy time with our families, I want to very clearly uh, warn that driving while taking drink and drugs is never acceptable behaviour. One drink can impair decision making and cause a collision which can kill. I implore drivers to never ever drink or take drugs and drive this Christmas or ever. And finally, as your public transport services continue to operate all throughout the pandemic and they are available all over the Christmas period, I would remind passengers, including post-primary children, that they must also wear a face covering too, because I'm conscious it's an issue that members have been raising. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. And uh, it's a very comprehensive answer. But can you also advise uh, if the PSNI are providing any additional resources to clamp down on drink driving and drug taking? The member will know that last month I brought a change in law which will abolish the driver's right to request a replacement blood or urine specimen where a breath specimen is marginally above the legal alcohol limit. The removal of the statutory option is a much needed update to road traffic legislation here in Northern Ireland and is something that I work closely and in collaboration uh, with the PSNI uh, in terms of its delivery. There is no excuse for drink driving. I want to take a zero uh, tolerance approach to it. Uh, I know that the PSNI are taking a zero tolerance approach and so we will continue to work together to tackle drink driving and continue to send a very clear message that it is unacceptable and that it kills. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Cumber Greenway usage has increased by more than 75 per cent from April to November 2020, a welcome increase and an evidence base on which to target investment in walking and cycling at this route, not least in terms of lighting. Will the Minister commit to investing in a new network of cycle counters on key streets, roads and greenways to enable further targeted investment in active travel across Northern Ireland? I thank the member for his question. It is something that we are actively exploring as part of our Blue Green um, Fund. As the member has rightly said, we may look at the usage figures for the Cumber Greenway. And in fact, uh, recently at the Waterways Ireland meeting, uh, we were reminded again of the exponential growth in the number of people who are embracing uh, our greenways um, and our uh, our our laggings as well. Um, so I want to do what I can to progress this. I'm a firm believer if you build it, they will come, but we always need an evidence base. And so that's why we are looking to see, can we put more counters in places so that we can provide the evidence of what is happening, this quiet revolution that we know is happening when it comes to people embracing active travel and reconnecting with nature and each other. Supplementary for Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can, the, can the Minister provide some update then with relation to the, the budget allocation for active travel next financial year? I wish I was in a position to be able to confirm that. I wish I was able to say that we have seen a vast increase in the allocations to my department, enabling me to do so much more. But what I can assure the member is, even in the absence of having that information, I remain committed to doing what I can to progress this uh, agenda while I remain as Minister for Infrastructure. Okay, Linda Dillon. Quick question from Linda Dillon. Minister, I'll, I'll roll my question and my supplementary into one, if that's helpful. We have discussed before the issue around dangerous trees along roadsides, and I know that you had outlined what the department's official position is. What I'm asking now is that the department do a scoping exercise to see if there's anything further that they can do, because I know that I certainly have reported many more trees that are dangerous, but also that have fallen across the road. And I would ask the minister would commit to meeting with me and a constituent of mine whose daddy was killed by a fallen tree last year, and she's campaigning to have this issue addressed. 
and I'm, I'm very aware of the case that the member has raised and the fact that she has made representations to me on this issue. The member will also know that there are complex issues around land ownership uh, as well and responsibility legally in that regard, but I'm more than happy to meet with the member uh, and with her constituent to discuss what the department is doing, our approach, and what we can do working with other partners. Thank you for that, Minister, and uh, that concludes our time is now up. If members choose to take their ease, please, while we change the top table and uh, to the prepare for the next topic.